Hi, good evening, I'm Steve Pank. Athletes, highly trained machines designed to the peak of perfection. They fight, run, synchronise, swim, all for our entertainment. But what happens when these monsters of our own creation go bad? Well, tonight, we're here to find out. We've gathered together enough evidence to shake the entire world of sport to its very foundations. So brace yourself, because this is what happens when athletes attack. Those of a nervous disposition, be warned, because tonight we'll be bringing you shocking scenes like these from around the world, including the incredible story of the Brazilian superstar, otherwise known as the Animal. The terrible truth of what happens when rodeos go wrong. A foul-mouthed dressing room damaged done by a bunch of football managers. Get out! Fuck off! Fucking you idiot! Fuck off! And what it's like to be bitten by mighty Mike Tyson. Evander Holyfield reveals all. Now then, there are many reasons why athletes attack. A bad decision, an unfortunate tattle, not being able to sit on the back seat of the team bus. <laughs> Whatever the reason, young people must learn that the sports field is not the place for fighting. No, the place for fighting is, of course, behind the bike sheds after school. <laughs> Lessons need to be learned because the sad truth of the matter is that for whatever reason, virtually every sport in every nation is infected with a virus of violence. It's a worldwide problem and this is the global overview. Mexico, April 1st, 1997. A friendly football match between Jamaica and Mexican club side Torres Nazar turns nasty after some bad tackles. Full-scale pitch battle develops and punches and flying kicks are exchanged. Eventually, some Jamaican players get tired of brawling and go off to the woods to collect sticks and stones to hit the opposition with. Later, the Jamaican coach defended his players, saying they lacked international experience. Allegedly, they would have normally brought their own sticks and stones, but they forgot. <laughs> Thailand, March 1998. The Thailand national soccer team take on Kazakhstan in a friendly in Bangkok. Unfortunately, their brave but foolish experiment to combine football with kickboxing was not a success. <laughs> Ireland, June 1996. The Irish have a special term for when a sport gets violently out of control. They call it Gaelic football. This match is between Antrim and Carven. To the untrained eye, it's difficult to see where the game ends and the punch-up begins. The match commentator, however, is quick to point out that there is no place for such behaviour in the modern game. More's the pity. Those of a certain age group, certainly those who were born before 1945 or watching us tonight, will remember the days when that was fair game. <laughs> India, May 1995, and some disgraceful scenes of police brutality during the Aga Khan Cup final. This bad tackle was the catalyst for a punch-up between the Indian Airlines team in orange and the Punjabi police team in red. Strangely, the police incident report later stated that the severe bottom bruising sustained during this attack was a result of the offender falling repeatedly onto the officer's hockey stick. <laughs> Japan, May 1994. Baseball is a sport where they've dispensed with sticks and gone one better and given the players big bats. The only thing is, when a baseball fight breaks out, the players drop the bats and go for it with their fists. Some would say it's a cynical attempt to make what is basically a big, girly game of rounders seem more macho. <laughs> Here's another example from Venezuela featuring the Caracas Lions against the Lara Cardinals. The pattern is always the same. First the pitcher hits the batsman, then everyone else hits everyone else. <laughs> After this brawl, ten players were sent off for being boring and not joining in. Argentina, February 1994. In Buenos Aires, journalists besieged the home of controversial soccer star Diego Maradona after he'd been sacked by his football club. The pint-sized superstar declined to comment, deciding instead to use the journalists for shooting practice with his air rifle. <laughs> But that didn't deter the RG press, so Maradona turned his hand of God to a little bit of gardening, hosing down the TV crews outside his house. It's always tragic to see a once great figure behaving in such an undignified and tragic fashion. Still, he did cheat us out of the World Cup, so sod him. 
Boxing, by definition, is a violent sport. Opponents of boxing will tell you that the sight of two men hitting each other for money is degrading. Argue with them on this point and they'll punch your lights out. <laughs> violent it may be, but boxing still has its own code of conduct, a code which some boxers don't understand. Take, for example, the ex-heavyweight champion of the world, Riddick Bowe. He knows that at a press conference, his job is to act mean and threaten his opponent in order to sell more tickets. The one thing he's not supposed to do is take all this bravado seriously. That's Riddick on the right in the white t-shirt, where at a pre-bout press conference, his opponent is Larry Donald. Now, at this point, Donald obviously says something to offend him. Well, they calling you the best, so when I beat you, then I am champ. Well, that's not gonna happen. Riddick takes this personally, and after all, who wouldn't? Bo went on to win a rather dull bout on points, having won the much more exciting press conference on a technical knockout. So, be warned, athletes can attack when you least expect them to. Another example. When the bell rings at the end of the round in boxing, you have to stop fighting. Simple. We also know that boxing is a two-man sport. Let's take a look at Mr. Bo in action again. This time in the ring, breaking both these rules with breathtaking ease. Here he is fighting Elijah Tillery. As the bell, suddenly what was a boxing match becomes a tag team wrestling bout. Watch out for Riddick Bowe's manager, Rock Newman, who decides he wants to take on Tillery personally outside the ring. The interesting footnote to this fight was that Elijah Tillery, who was hit after the bell, manhandled out of the ring by his opponent's manager, and stamped on by the crowd, was the one who was disqualified. A decision that must make Lennox Lewis think himself very, very lucky. That decision, and many more like it in the 80s and 90s, has given boxing a bad name over the years. But one fight in particular has gone down in history as the day the fight game hung its head in shame. <laughs> Saturday night, 20th of June, 1997. It was the early hours of the morning at the MGM Grand in Las Vegas. The mecca of boxing was getting ready to witness the fight of the decade between Iron Mike Tyson and Evander Holyfield in Judgment Night 2. After losing his heavyweight title to Holyfield in Judgment Night 1, Mighty Mike was back again in the most spectacular rematch ever seen. It was a fight that would make boxing history for all the wrong reasons. The referee that night was Mills Lane, who remembers nothing unusual about the atmosphere before the fight. Before the fight, both fighters I thought were very focused. They both had their business faces on. We went in to Tyson first. He was getting taped. He asked us to wait for that. We got wrapped. After we got through with Mike Tyson, went to Evander Holyfield. He was uh, walking around, uh, singing gospel to himself, uh, very relaxed. For Evander Holyfield, the fight started well, but all that was about to change as they moved towards the fateful round three. The fight with Mike Tyson. Felt that I should have had him out in round one. Round two, he was there, it was a lot of clenching and tugging and all that. And so round three, he came out to shoot his best shot. And, and the fact that he was doing this all, he found that his all wasn't good enough and I was still standing. And, and that's when he, you know, seen his opportunity and he bit my ear. He looked at me and he said, I got him frustrated. I think I have it. The round gets down to about, I think maybe 35 seconds left. It was toward the end of the round. And I'm really kind of out of position. I'm kind of behind and to the left of Mike Tyson. Now I see Mike Tyson's head go down. And the next thing I know, Holyfield jumps up and grabs both ears like this. He says, he bit me, he bit me. <laughs> so I look at the ear. I can see a tear. I didn't know how bad it was, but I could see a tear. I knew right then it wasn't a punch. It was a bite. <laughs> With Holyfield bleeding profusely from the bite, ringside doctor Flip Hermansky was called into the ring to check the damage. When I first looked at the ear, uh, I mean, I was taken aback. I've never seen an injury like this in 20 years of being ringside. There was actually tissue missing from Evander's ear. 
Incredibly, slow motion images of the incident actually show the piece of ear being spat out. I felt at this point that while it was a serious injury, that medically the fight didn't have to be stopped. I said, can he go? Can he fight? And Dr. Omansky said, yep, he can fight. I said, he can fight. He said, yes, he can go. He can fight. When the referee said box, he came back into it and he throws some hard shots. And I was able to take him and I reeled off by two or three shots and scared him again. And he says, I got to get out of here. And he bit my other ear. Then I walked to Tyson's corner and said, that's it, man. You're done. You're gone. And then Tyson uh, went kind of crazy, a little bit crazy, and uh, started pushing and punching, and the police security came in. But I just think he lost it. I just think he lost it. So, in a moment of madness, Mike Tyson lost $30 million and gained a one-year ban. But the story wasn't over yet. Ringside steward Mitch Libernati was working in Holyfield's corner that night. After the ring had cleared out, I walked across the ring to check everything out, talked to some other co-workers, and uh, we talked about, you know, piece of ear and, and someone being bit, Evander being bit, and as I looked down below my feet, the piece of ear was there. I was shocked. It was incredible. Uh, my, I remember just feeling, God, I got a piece of his ear. You know, he needs this. And I, that's all I had thought. It ain't about anything else but getting it back to him. It looked pretty damaged. I mean, you got to figure, there's about 50 people in that ring, and that ear had been trampled on for about 20 minutes. So when I got it, it was pretty dry and pretty flat. Libertati took the piece of ear to Holyfield's dressing room, but somehow it was mislaid, either lost or stolen. I believe it was Philadelphia or Atlantic City. Uh, someone, a broker, said he had bought it from a, a security guard or an employee for anywhere between eighteen and thirty thousand dollars. So while some were trying to cash in, for one man, the missing piece is neither here nor there. It's a battle scar. It means more than what a lot of people think. Because, you know, I, I couldn't have bit him back. I could have made things worse for myself and him. But, you know, I, I chose to do what God wanted me to do. I truly believe that if we both start biting each other, it would have been a great reason to end the game of boxing. Now it's time to shout break, but stay with us, fight fans, for more stories of athletic atrocities. Still to come, find out what happens when football managers completely lose it. Give your fucking money! Fucking money! And look at your umpires because Max on the attack. That's my question! The question, jerk!